All right. Yeah. Well, uh, thank you everybody for being here. Um, this is a pretty spectacular captive audience to have. Uh, so let's get into it. So I'm going to tell you a bit about some aspect of my work, uh, which is really trying to push the frontier of uh, looking for wave-like dark matter, both on sort of the theory and the observational level. All right. So let's get into what that means. No. Okay. That's Ben. Your pointers let me down. <laughs> That's fine. Thank you. All right, and tech support. He's good at many things. <laughs> okay, so where we were. Uh, wave like dark matter. And I. Uh... Okay, we're going to do this differently. Wave like dark matter. Okay, so. Um... Whenever we talk about new ideas in dark matter, we always go back and talk about what the old ideas were. And what I want to point out to you are like two things here. So on the right, what I'm showing you is sort of the, the canonical picture that we've thought about dark matter detection for in a really long time. And this is the picture that where you have where you say, ah, my dark matter is some heavy particle, and maybe that dark matter particle can scatter off of itself, or can scatter off of standard model particles, or maybe standard model particles can scatter off of one another and make dark matter, fine. But it's always a discussion about particles, dark matter particles either in the in states or the out states of some scattering process. So this has been, again, animated about 40 years of effort. But on the other hand, if you look at the plot on the left, and I don't want you to try to extract any individual meeting from these colored contours, uh, but this is trying to illustrate what is the landscape of dark matter models that we have out there. And uh, really, this paradigm where we have weakly interacting massive particles at about the 100 GeV scale, this is just but a small island inside this, this model space. And so while uh, our efforts to search may have been a little bit blinkered, our ideas on what was out there uh, are not. And so what I think is really exciting about this moment in, in dark matter phenomenology and dark matter searches is that it's not so much a radical rethinking of what could be out there, but a rethinking of uh, what is worth looking for and what can we do at this moment uh, with laboratory-based experiment and astrophysical and cosmological observation. Cool. So uh, one of the sort of ideas that, that people have been thinking about quite a bit as we try to tr go past this 100 GeV WIMP dark matter paradigm is maybe that saying dark matter is, uh oh, well, 15 minute talk, we'll make it. Um, <laughs> All right, so one of the ways that we're trying to, to break out of this heavy uh, wimp dark matter paradigm is by saying, what if the language that we should use to talk about uh, dark matter is not even really the language of particles? What if we should actually be talking about waves? And if I can make sort of a classical analogy, uh, when we think about electromagnetism we think, and we think about photons, right, we discovered uh, electromagnetism not first as in the individual quanta of photons, but we instead found uh, electromagnetic fields which are themselves are governed by sort of wave dynamics. And so it might be that the first place we would see uh, dark matter, if it were sufficiently light to have a very large number density and therefore behave like a wave, is again through these coherent wave dynamics rather than the scatterings of individual particles off of one another. And so I just wanted to highlight some work being done here at MIT uh, by Mark Vogelsberger, often the, uh, the Kavli, and Mustafa Amin, a former Papillardo fellow, who looked and said, well, what happens on uh, sort of cosmological scales uh, regarding the, the formation of collapsed structure through gravitational dynamics if the dark matter is so light that its de Broglie wavelength is so, so long that it would actually disrupt the formation of, of uh, objects like galaxies and clusters. And so this is an idea that really starts by saying like gravitational interactions are the way we have evidence for, for dark matter and how should we be rethinking that evidence or really using that evidence to uh, more rigorously test the dark matter hypothesis. Now, on the other hand, uh, this is only a test of gravitational interactions of dark matter. And so if we want to say, I want to look at wave dark matter and I want to use the wave property to, to discover it, well, I still have to go back and I have to put myself in the context of a, a particle physics model. And so here I want to motivate the, a really exciting particle physics model uh, called the axion. So to motivate the axion, I want to talk about the... That's not going away. I want to uh, talk about the, something called the strong CP problem. And the strong CP problem is really related to a very basic question, which is to say, what happens if you take a neutron and you put it in an electric field? Now, 
if you know the quark content of the neutron, uh, you would say, okay, well, it has an up quark and it has two down quarks. That means it's electrically neutral, and so it's not going to go anywhere when I expose it to that magnetic or that electric field. And so that's, of course, totally correct, but it's an incomplete answer. Uh, because you've really only told me something about the electric monopole moment of the neutron. One question we could ask is, should the, uh, the neutron have an electric dipole moment? Which is really what you would expect if you said, okay, the, the quarks are distributed in some way, and so maybe if I, expo I expose that neutron to an electric field, then the neutron gets torqued a little bit, and so it, um, it, it begins to process. Uh, so that's sort of the, the, the classical physics question, and you can indeed sort of convince yourself that unless the quarks are aligned in a very precise way so as to make that neutron electric dipole moment vanish, that uh, it should be there. If you wanted to go and ask that at the level of the field theory, what you're really asking about is the structure of the theory of quantum chromodynamics, which is going to tell you about how gluons and quarks interact, and really is going to tell you about how those quarks are distributed within the neutron. And so uh, it turns out, if you took quantum chromodynamics and you tried to calculate the neutron electric dipole moment, uh, you would say the neutron has no electric dipole moment. And that's because actually we, we forbid that uh, presence of an NEDM by the way that we construct uh, QCD. What really that's saying is that I'm showing you a term here which has a theta bar and a G and a G tilde, and I want you to see the G and the G tilde as gluons, and uh, this is telling you some specific pattern of interaction with the gluons. That's the term that would induce a neutron electric dipole moment if it were present, but we, write, we don't include it in, in the theory of QCD. So let's just imagine for a second that we were going to, and uh, what's really going to control the strength of that gluon interaction that gives me an NEDM is the value of that theta bar, which I can kind of think of as an angular parameter. So in your head, you should be thinking it's living somewhere between zero and two pi. Uh, if it lives somewhere between zero and two pi, and I'm super naive, I might say like one is a typical value for theta bar. Maybe our universe made one random draw from the, the distribution from where that theta bar uh, follows. But uh, what we can do is we can go and we can calculate what should the neutron electric dipole moment be in terms of the value of that theta bar. And I'll find that it would be about 10 to the minus 16 uh, times whatever theta bar is in units of electron charge centimeters. And while that may sound small, it's actually uh, very big compared to what we're able to measure in the lab. So we go out, we do those measurements, and what we find is that we can't detect a neutron electric dipole moment, and that sort of justifies our construction of QCD without this term. But on the other hand, it raises a different question. Uh, this is a, a parameter that could have ranged from zero to two pi, but with uh, experiment, we can constrain it to be less than one part in 10 to the 10. And, and so that seems very, very suspicious, or like maybe we're misunderstanding some aspect of the theory or dynamics, uh, and that there's a, there's a more fundamental reason that theta bar should be so small other than that, just because. So, uh, the way the axion comes into this picture is uh, we're gonna introduce a new field to solve our messes, and so that's why the axion is named after a brand of dish detergent. Uh, so what we do is we introduce the axion into our theory of, of sort of extended QCD, and we're going to introduce it so that it modifies this G, G tilde term, much in the same way that the theta bar uh, parameter does. The difference between theta bar, though, and the axion field A is that while theta bar is some, just some fixed parameter, A is a dynamical field. And what that means is A is going to experience, it experiences some potential, I haven't told you what it is yet, but it will experience some potential and it will try to take on the configuration that minimizes its energy. It turns out, if you work out what that potential is, uh, then you will find that the axion field is expected to take a value that is exactly minus theta bar. And in doing so, what you've done is you've given yourself a, a, a sort of a dynamical explanation for how the axion field would exactly cancel out up to small perturbations, uh, whatever value that nature selected for us of theta bar. And so this is, this is work, uh, this is known as the Petchy quinn mechanism. It was introduced in the late 70s by Petchy and Quinn, uh, and then really uh, developed much further by uh, Weinberg and Wilczek in the following year. Okay, so um, the other sort of cool thing here is that I introduced a new particle, an axion, so that I could try to solve this strong CP problem associated with the absence of the neutron electric dipole moment. But uh, if you've introduced a new particle, you should say, ah, maybe that particle can have some abundance in the universe. And then you go, oh, actually, there's an abundance that I would really like to match. It's the dark matter abundance. And so uh, now you can say, great, I'll solve two problems at once. I'll have an axion. I'll have it realized in abundance in the universe today. To, to resolve the dark matter, and also just by introducing it in the, in the spectrum in the first place, I've solved the strong CP problem. 
So this is now showing you uh, sort of the parameter space uh, for axions. So on the x-axis, I have the possible axion mass in units of EV. And on the y-axis, I have the axion coupling to photons in units of inverse GeV. So these, uh, these red and green and blue uh, regions, these correspond to regions that have been uh, ruled out by laboratory measurement and astrophysical observation. Uh, but what you should notice is that there is an awful lot of white space in this plot, which really is saying, one, we have an enormous range of masses that we actually have to go and consider if we're serious about fully probing the axion hypothesis, but two, that we haven't done that yet, and we need to come up with new ideas and approaches. Uh, the region that's particularly motivated here, if you want to solve both the strong CP problem and, uh, and say my axion it can also be the dark matter, is living on this band. And, uh, or rather, the band is saying this yellow region, this is where an axion would solve the strong CP problem, and then we're just going to hope uh, that it also realizes the correct abundance of dark matter. Uh, so there's a question here, like, can we, um, oh, I should also explain the picture on the right. Uh, that is me with the, uh, the abracadabra instrument. That's an experiment being operated out of MIT by uh, Professor Lindley Winslow and her group. And uh, I have this picture of me next to it, and I also have a picture of me holding a big wrench somewhere. I haven't been able to track that one down, but it makes the experimentalists nervous. Um, great. And so some of the, the constraints that are set by Abracadabra are actually living on this plot. But, but again, the, the, the real takeaway here is that there's a lot of parameter space to get to, uh, and it's really because we don't have a, a great guiding principle here in terms of what is the right axion mass to be looking for if we want it to solve the strong CP problem and be the dark matter. So the question is then, uh, can we do some theory that lets us get a better handle on that problem? And the answer is both yes and no. And I'm, so I'm going to start out with the no. So the way that we could try to understand this is by saying, well, the axion has some uh, initial configuration in the early universe, and let's start by hypothesizing that it is homogeneous. And so that's the sort of the configuration you would expect if you had an axion field that was realized before inflation, and then inflation blew everything up, so all you see is some smooth field value. Okay, in that case, uh, the axion, much like theta bar, is just really uh, being drawn from a distribution from zero to two pi, and uh, then you might say, all right, well, there's some dynamics in terms of how the axion starts at some place in the potential, and then rolls down to the bottom of the potential, and it has some fluctuations left around today that are the dark matter. But uh, you, know, you can really choose your favorite mass, and then you can go back and you can calculate a, a value of the initial axion field that would cause you to get the correct abundance for that mass. And so this scenario is, uh, is not particularly helpful for us in terms of uh, using theory to guide experiment. But there's a, another scenario, and one that's um, ah, good. This is just an illustration of the axion. It starts out at some field value, and it uh, decays away and wiggles around at late times. Now, um, a different scenario we could think about is uh, if the axion is realized after the end of inflation. And if the axion is realized after the end of inflation, what we have living in our sort of observable universe today is many little patches of the universe that at early times were not in causal contact with one another. So that means you can sort of think about every little uh, independent patch of the universe uh, having an axion field drawn excuse me, having an axion field that's drawn from this sort of uniform distribution between zero and two pi. But you because you have so many of these little causally independent regions, you have actually incredible sampling power. Uh, and you can fully characterize the statistics of what is the initial configuration of the axion. So uh, now we can say, oh, I know what the, uh, precisely the typical value of theta, or the initial value of the axion field is. And that's because I'm making like, something like 10 to the 50 draws of it as realized in our present day observable universe. Uh, on the other hand, uh, we have a little bit of a challenge because now that there are these, uh, all these little patches where the axion field is drawn independently, as they come into causal contact with one another, uh, their evolution, as they would really like to roll down to the bottom of the potential, has to be compatible with their neighbors. Their neighbor, they're going to talk to each other. And really what I'm saying is that uh, the axion is going to behave like a classical field, but a classical field with propagating waves in it, uh, and that because I have a complicated potential, the dynamics of waves in that complicated field will themselves be complicated. So now I'm showing you, uh, sort of cast in intimidation form on the bottom left, what are the sort of the equations that we need to solve if we want to talk seriously about the evolution of the axion field in this uh, post-inflationary misalignment scenario that I'm describing. And so some features should be uh, recognizable. OK, I have like theta double dot, so some field with its second time derivative. And then I have this funny nabla, so a Laplacian. And we recognize that as just sort of a, a, a standard wave equation 
but then a plus lots of nonlinear interactions. And the place that the nonlinear actions are going to become challenging is when the axion field manages to wind itself around this potential, which looks like uh, one of these Sabrero potentials, essentially. And it, it can get stuck around the core of that potential. And it will have a, a difficult time uh, sort of relaxing down to its uh, energy minimizing configuration. So in doing so, you get sort of a spatially extended 1D and 2D objects that are at very, very large scales, uh, compare, or sorry, very, very small scales, rather, compared to the, the large scale of the causal horizon of the universe. So let me show you a little picture of what that looks like. So here we have these topological defects called strings and domain walls. Uh, and now they're going to evolve for some time uh, before they eventually collapse giving me a late time axion field configuration from which I can go and try to do a calculation of the abundance of the axion as a function of its mass. So this simulation uh, looks cool, I think. Uh, I, I am also going to tell you that it was like a very uh, novice effort at some, on some level in that um, it was a, this was done with a uh, lattice that was 2,000 cubed uh, lattice sites. And that sounded big to me at the time as somebody who wasn't seriously involved in numerical modeling. But uh, for my simulator friends, they would tell me, oh, that's, that's nothing. OK, so um, we're getting more sophisticated. And the, the way that we're getting more sophisticated is in a way that sort of is trying to address what's intrinsically challenging about this problem, which is that you're evolving the axion field in a cosmological context. And that means that you're, you have an expanding scale factor. That means that when you set your lattice coordinates, uh, the proper distance between them is effectively growing. Or in other words, your lattice is losing resolution. And that's a challenge because the, the scale of the features that we saw before, the, the domain walls and the strings, the 1D and 2D objects, these are set by like the mass of the, the axion, essentially. The mass, and, and so those are fixed, uh, but now my, um, my, my coordinates are getting, uh, or my, my lattice is becoming worse resolved, and so I lose resolution of these features. On top of that, I have to have a really big box. And the reason is, if my box eventually is smaller than the causal horizon, then I'm going to have finite volume effects. That means uh, parts of my simulation that shouldn't have been able to talk to one another are now talking to one another, and the, the results don't make any sense. Uh, so the way we're handling this now is by using an adaptive mesh refinement approach to say, oh, we have these 1D and 2D objects that are at super small scales. But uh, they're, they're, are, you know, dimension, they're, they're of a lower dimensionality than the 3D simulation volume that we're, we're trying to hold. And so what we'll do is we'll add extra resolution with this, uh, our fancy meshing technique so that we can resolve those 1D and 2D objects uh, without trying to resolve the entire uh, 3D simulation box. So what I'm showing you now uh, are, is just a 2D slice through a simulation that um, has a base resolution of 8,000 cubed lattice sites. So we're getting you know, 64 times bigger. But in fact, this, uh, this lattice is going to have adaptive refinement such that if you were using just a single static lattice, you would have needed to use a lattice of size 131,072 cubed grid sites. And so uh, I guess for reference, uh, that lattice would not fit on any uh, supercomputing cluster uh, built in the world. So you really need to be using these fancy techniques. And so I'm going to show you an animation here. But I want you to look at this uh, little yellow square, because that's going to show you what's being tracked in sort of the two components of the field that are shown then zoomed in on the right. OK, so you can see that the field is sort of relaxing. The, the, uh, the sharp features are becoming uh, less, um, less dense in numbers compared to the box. And now what we do is we zoom in and we show the full resolution uh, of these simulations. And so this is a 2D cross section of one of these one dimensional uh, topological defects called strings, which we're keeping at very, very good resolution now, uh, even though in sort of the, the coarsest level of the lattice, they would be out of resolution. So by doing this, we can do a simulation that goes, uh, you know, is a bigger box and makes more efficient use of the resources available to us. Um, and we can use that to try to make a, a calculation of what the axion mass is in this post-inflationary scenario. And so uh, here I'm showing you that same, um, that same axion parameter space uh, overlaid with all of the uh, sort of new ideas we have on how to go look for axions. Um, and the little star here corresponding to the preferred mass region uh, pointed to by these simulations. And so Frank is back uh, because Frank had a great idea with the axion and then he followed it up decades later with a great idea for how to look for the axion called the plasma haloscope. 
Turns out the plasma haloscope, which is proposed uh, but not, and not built yet, uh, is precisely ex the experiment you would want to build if you want to go after the, the axion at the mass that, uh, that we point to uh, from these simulations. So I think I'm running out of time, but uh, I want to say one other thing, which is just that um, I showed you one aspect of the, the axion wave dynamics. And there the story is that the axion um, has nonlinear interactions with itself, and it makes those wave dynamics uh, challenging to evolve. A different thing, you, another way that wave dynamics can be uh, at least interesting, uh, more interesting than a like simple harmonic oscillator, let's say, is you can have the mixing of waves. And one, uh, one interesting mixing of waves that the axion can have is it can mix with the, the photon field. And it turns out at, uh, at neutron stars, uh, the axion can mix particularly efficiently with the photon field, uh, producing uh, radio emission that I am now using SETI data uh, to constrain. It turns out SETI has some of the best uh, uh, data at these neutron stars and lets us set some of the best constraints that we can uh, on uh, axions in actually a similar mass range uh, to the one pointed to by the simulation work I previously discussed. And so I'm excited to push this forward as well. It seems that uh, with coming improvements in radio observation facilities that are available to us, we'll be able to push very close to, if not fully into, the, uh, the preferred uh, QCD axion parameter space for, again, this range of sort of tens of micro EV axions. And I think this is something exciting that I'm looking forward to pursuing further. Okay, so I deferred my thank you to the end of my talk, and, and so it made me look particularly ungracious compared to everybody who went before. But I really just want to say a big thank you to the, the, the Papillardos um, for making it possible for me to be here. I mean, for, like, and also, of course, to thank the really excellent people I get to interact with all the, all the time. Uh, Tracy Slatcher, Jesse Thaler, and Lindley Winslow are faculty here, and like, they're really excellent people that made me want to be here. And on top of that, there are all these really excellent people that I've come into contact uh, through because of MIT in one way or another, including my, my former advisor, Ben Safdie, uh, Yoni Khan and Nick Rod, who were uh, grad students here, Jesse Shelton, who's uh, here because MIT is, she also thinks MIT is a great place and is on sabbatical uh, visiting. And then I should also point to some, uh, some students and uh, postdocs that uh, I'm working with here, uh, from here, including Yitian Sun, uh, Sarah Geller, Kiara Salemi, and John Ouellette. All right, uh, thank you for listening to my spiel, and I'm happy to take questions if there are any. is that um, dark matter clearly interacts with itself because the clumping that mm. happens is presumably a gravitational yep. cause. Is there some other? Uh, I'm tempted to use the word force, but we only have four of them, but is there some other? I, I mean, so in some sense, you can think of these, uh, the self-interaction of this ac the axion field as sort of a, a, a self-force. And I think one, one thing that would be really interesting to better understand is uh, you point to, to gravitational uh, clustering in the dark matter field. It would be really nice to fully understand uh, how does the axion and its nonlinear interactions modify that gravitational clustering process. And so actually, this is, this is I, I think I may have undersold these simulations a little bit because they don't just tell us the right mass, but they give us the starting point for how to uh, uh, make other, do other calculations and make other projections. One of those calculations being the end of that simulation is in some sense like the initial condition for the axion in the early universe as it begins to undergo structure formation. And so one of the things I hope to be able to do is take the results of that simulation and run it through uh, really gravitational and body codes or, or similar approaches to understand, yes, what is the, what is the effect of that interaction on um, structure formation and what interesting does the axion do uh, at small scales uh, that may or may not be relevant for observational efforts. Yeah. Right. How are radio searches sensitive to axions? I, I missed that part. Yes, awesome. I, I, I'm so so uh, the, the point here is, uh, 
So okay, I have an axion. It turns out it can mix with a photon, and so I can go from axion wave to photon wave. The radio part was a little bit mysterious. I didn't tell, give you enough information to get that part. So the story there is really like an energy conservation argument. And uh, what you're saying is, let's say I have a, a, an axion that has a mass of tens of uh, micro EV. And if I'm going to convert it to a photon, it needs to have the same, uh, the same amount of energy. And so then I go, okay, great, I have a 10 micro EV photon. Uh, what type of photon is that? It turns out to be a radio photon. Um, and, and so this is just a fact associated with the, the particular mass range of axions that you're looking for with this technique. What's the neutron star connection with that? Thank you. Yes. So um, the funny thing about the axion photon mixing is that the axion photon mixing needs already for there to be a large photon field background. And so if you ask, like, what can we do to provide a large photon field background? Uh, you know, in the lab, we try to say, okay, let's like put my 10 Tesla magnet down here and see what we can do with axions. But neutron stars have magnetic fields that are as strong as 10 to the 11 Tesla. And so I'm in its essence giving myself an extremely large background uh, field of photons uh, uh, to interact with and hopefully get the largest signal possible. Other questions? Jeff? Thanks for the talk. Uh, I, I guess two questions. I didn't quite catch how your simulations give a mass range in the sense of like what goes wrong if you're too light or too heavy. Also, uh, based on the patchiness that you observe, what does that say about direct dark matter detection in the sense of might it be that we're just in a region of space that has no dark matter and then we're never gonna see it, you know what I mean? Yes, um, okay, so uh, I'm showing you simulations in, in terms of sort of de-dimensionalized units, uh, but really what I can do is I can say I have a field value uh, for the axion as a result of this simulation, and then I know the energy density associated with that field is really just mass squared times field value squared. And so by taking whatever the field configurations that we get and hoping that at the end of this we have good enough statistics on, on sort of the, the horizon scale. In this box I have four horizons at the end of the, uh, the simulation um, that we can get an estimate for like what is the average density uh, in the axion field and then we can extrapolate that from early times into the present day cosmological abundance of dark matter. So that's the first part of your question I think. The second part of the question is um, Yes, I, I, you can see that things are quite patchy. Uh, of course, they are patchy on scales that are uh, very small. Um, so uh, this should not allay your concerns <laughs> about um, whether or not uh, direct detection is disrupted. And the re what this means is that, okay, you, get some, you could potentially have some enhanced small scale structure formation. So maybe we can imagine that there are a whole bunch of like axion mini halos of like a mass 10 to the minus 11 solar masses or maybe even smaller flying around in the Milky Way. And it would be quite disappointing for direct detection if all of the Milky Way's dark matter was living inside those small halos because the probability that we would be sitting in, inside one of those mini sub halos of the Milky Way uh, would be extremely small. It would be overwhelmingly likely that we would be sitting inside of a dark matter void. Uh, and yeah, maybe, um, maybe direct detection just doesn't work in this scenario. Um, that's, uh, I, I think, something that needs to be understood um, much better. And actually part of the reason that I'm excited about these sort of like radio searches, which typically are, are performed in such violent, high stellar density environments that even if the dark matter was in these mini halos, the dark matter would have been ripped apart by tidal disruption. Uh, so. We have time for one more question. Paul? What fraction of the dark matter uh, would be in these axion condensations as opposed to something else? Yeah, so um, at the end of this, uh, this, um, oh boy, that would have been bad. Um, at the end of uh, sort of the, like the nonlinear part of this, uh, the axion field dynamics, the overdensities in the axion field are order one uh, on these very small scales, of course. So I think the, the, the naive answer is that like, on some level, all of the axion dark matter is going to end up uh, in these little uh, mini halos. I think a more important question is then, like, do these mini halos survive their increasing into uh, larger halos or, or, or not. I think that's the important question for asking, like how much of the, the dark matter in the Milky Way is really like ambient diffuse dark matter as opposed to like a large number of 10 to the minus 11 solar mass halos. Okay, uh, we need to stop there, so let's um, uh, thank Josh again.